What's going on in the broader industry, both you know within industries themselves, but even sort of the broader community of people working blockchains, to figure out what are the standards we're going to use so that we can take things like these cryptographic proofs, these RFID standards, and say this is what we're going to all agree upon to be the basis for the for the stuff that's going into the blockchain. When I think about what we're doing, I think about it always at two levels, right? So what is the underlying blockchain foundation? And then what is the solution that we're building on top of it? And I think within each of these, we need to be thinking about standards and interoperability. And with blockchain, it's more important than it's ever been with any technology before because blockchain is so fundamentally based on how do we engage this broad, diverse, untrusting group of folks. One of my greatest joys about being the executive director of, the, of this organization is that I'm always learning some new areas of technology. So now we've covered blockchain in distributed energy, we've covered blockchain in music, and now we're covering blockchain in, um, in supply chain. I'm really pleased to introduce our moderator tonight, Michael Casey. Michael is the Senior Advisor for Blockchain Research at the MIT Media Lab, and I'm thrilled to have him, so please welcome him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katya. Yeah. Um, it'll, do I have to crouch? No, I think it'll work. It's good. Yes, we're fine. Hi, uh, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Great to see everybody. It's a beautiful day outside, so... You know, I actually appreciate the, the effort of actually leaving the sun to come inside here. Um, look, I'm um, just a little bit about me, my background, because I think it helps to frame some of these things. I was a journalist for a long time. Don't hold that against me. Uh, 18 years at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, but the very first job that I had in my life uh, was a one-year stint in the audit department of Deloitte. Uh, I was an auditor, an accountant. I... I hated it. I absolutely loathed it. It changed my life by virtue of discovering that was definitely not what I wanted to do with my life. And I traveled and lived in strange places like Thailand and Indonesia and became a journalist and did a whole lot of things. And my life has gone full circle. I ended up leaving the journal, joining MIT, and what is at the center of my life? A ledger, right? It, it, it's, the blockchain is a ledger. It's nothing more than a mechanism for record keeping. So I find this kind of ironic. Um, I do try to tell people, though, that this is the sexiest ledger in the world. There, there really is something quite unique about this ledger uh, and, and that we should celebrate this. Uh, in the same way that I also think that this could be a moment of the joining of these forces because supply chains have been the sort of untold story of manufacturing for so long. In fact, they are the bread and butter, the underlying you know, infrastructure, if you like, of the global economy. And they've become all the more complex and all the more important the way we manage them as the world has become globalized. Um, and yet nobody really thinks about them very much. They just kind of like there in the distance and there is various logistics people and different you know, companies that worry about how the supplier arrangements are managed and, 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 and you know, which credentials and permissions are used to participate in these relationships, and yet the information that is shared across them is so important to how we logistically bring all the stuff from the ground to our tables or to our, uh, our homes. And, and now, I really believe uh, that with this technology, this potentially more transparent approach to the way that we share information across the members of these supply chains, we are kind of making it sexy. It's, 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 it's the visibility and the information, the, 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 the richness of what we can draw out of these supply chains now, the dynamism that could potentially be brought to them that I find really exciting. So just a quick couple of words on why the blockchain potentially could, could do this. Um, the blockchain, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is a mechanism for uh, collective action amongst entities or people who don't necessarily trust each other but have a common goal. So Bitcoin was created for this purpose. Everybody wants to share in the vision of a currency, a common currency, but knowing whether or not the other person has digitally counterfeited their money, has double spent it, in the words of the Bitcoin uh, community, um, 
was a concern. So Satoshi Nakamoto, the uh, inventor of this particular model, was able to create a system whereby an entirely decentralized community of computer managers would maintain this ledger uh, and prove that double spending wasn't happening. So the common goal of looking after this currency could now be managed not by a centralized institution like a bank, but rather distributed amongst uh, an entire decentralized community and thereby um, resolving this fundamental problem of trust. Because until that moment, this, this core aspect of human society, the, 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 the key piece by which we enter into exchange and form relationships, trust, has been managed by institutions, centralized institutions, that look after the ledger on our behalf. Uh, banks are the classic example of this, um, and uh, that worked relatively well. I think the, 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 the arrival of banking as the intermediaries into our payment system in the end of the 15th century when the Medici did this paved the way through to the Industrial Revolution, the modern world. But the, 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 this core problem of centralized management of that information um, was, was sort of fundamentally limiting. Uh, it had instability associated with it. We meant we had to trust these parties to maintain the ledger. So now we have this capacity to have that information managed in a decentralized way where no one single entity controls it. And once you reach that point, you have this capacity for all the participants in that community to trust each other because they don't have to trust one of them in particular. Uh, they can trust this collective system that, that through an algorithm that um, maintains their search for consensus, allows them to maintain and update this ledger on an ongoing basis without this dependence on a centralized party. And the reason why this has become very important for supply chains is because it actually is one of those quintessential environments where this problem is, is pertinent. You have entities who have a common interest uh, in ultimately producing as many and selling as many of a particular good that's going to be the, the finished good at the end of this line, but at the same time are separate from each other and therefore do not necessarily have trust because they're, they've got business relationships which are juxtaposed in various ways. So you have this, this I think, you know, we, we, look, we think about where blockchain applications are most relevant, it's these environments where there is a common interest, a common goal, but, but a lack of trust or, or the potential, a reason not necessarily to trust each other. So now we, we have this capacity to bring these two ideas together. And, and when you unpeel the onion of what that means, whereby the visibility, the capacity to share information about the production processes of each of these lines in a way that now everybody can presumably trust is not going to be exploited against them. You start to really open up possibilities for efficiency, for you know, management of, of resources, um, for you know, understanding where the things we buy come from, sort of food safety, all of these concerns can be, can be dealt with. And we're going to discuss all of these in this panel. So um, I'm going to start it up, though, by introducing, these guys are going to introduce each of themselves, but, but Bill Macbeth, why don't you um, come up first and uh, tell us a little bit about Chainlink and, uh, and, and take it from there. Sure. Thanks. I'm going to attempt to untether myself from this podium here a little bit. Uh, thanks so much, Michael. So I'm uh, Chief Research Officer and also co-founder of Chainlink Research. We were founded in 2002 to uh, mostly focus on supply chain and the links in the chain, hence uh, Chainlink. We also cover IoT and more recently, blockchain. Blockchain's been on our radar for many years, but the last, about 18 months ago, we decided this is getting serious, we better start covering it. And then about six months ago, I approached uh, the Enterprise Forum and said, we should do a session on this, and they agreed, and so hence was able to, we were able to organize this fabulous panel. So I'm going to, in the next six minutes, att attempt to give you kind of an overview foundation setting. For those of you familiar with blockchain, 
uh, it may be a little uh, redundant, and same with supply chain, but usually there's not much of a, that big of an intersection in that Venn diagram. So what is blockchain? This is uh, our definition. It'd be interesting to see if the panels agrees. Secure, immutable, decentralized, shared ledger. So let's break that down. Uh, first thing, it is a ledger, uh, but it's more than traditional transactions. You can record uh, Internet of Things uh, information or, or sensor data or any data that you want to encapsulate, uh, but it does have a, a sequence and a time that is, is uh, bound in there so nobody can start saying something happened in a different order. Uh, it's shared, so it's shared across usually a network of entities. It could be within one company, but its real value is when you start getting multiple players, as Michael said, uh, that, that don't, don't trust each other. And it's decentralized, so no one party has control of this thing, and uh, multiple parties have to agree that, hey, what's in here? It's verified by multiple parties so that uh, everybody can trust what's in there. That verification happens via cryptography and things like hashes and digital signatures, and we can get into some of that if we want to uh, during the session. But that makes this, the fact that you have multiple parties that are all keeping their eye on this and you use this cryptography, it makes it very secure, one of the most secure uh, types of databases we've seen so far. And uh, that makes it also immutable. So what that means is it can't change. Those are the rules. If you make a mistake when you write a record, you don't delete the record or modify it. You have to put in another record that backs that one out and puts the right data in, or some, some mechanisms have to revoke a record and then, and then put a new one. But you can't delete uh, a record or change it. So that's the characteristics. Now, a little bit of background. Most of you probably associated with Bitcoin, which is a cryptocurrency. There are now over 1,000 cryptocurrencies, but Bitcoin was really the first one. But it built on technologies that have been out there in many cases for decades, all of this cryptography, the hash, hashing algorithms, this Byzantine fault tolerance and proof of work that's been floating around out there. And then um, just when you get into this, you'll see there are many different um, there's, well, the, the dominant ones are Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Hyperledger, and then there's many variations. There's also uh, private uh, or, or um, proprietary blockchains, but um, they're all different, and in particular in the consensus algorithms makes a huge difference in the amount of horsepower it takes to validate a transaction, how many folks it takes, as well as the amount of time it takes. So the characteristics of how these perform uh, is really important to understand when you're trying to figure out what blockchain and IBM and the other people in the Hyperledger uh, community uh, have put together a really kind of an open framework so you can plug in different consensus algorithms and so forth. The public versus permission is really important, uh, I think especially for supply chain because people think of Bitcoin where you're anonymous and in supply chain, most supply chain applications that doesn't work. You want to know who you're dealing with and you want to know that with confidence. Uh, so permission supply chain. Plus, you don't want your transactions to be visible to everybody. You want to say, hey, me and this small group of people can see this. I don't want my competitors looking at that as, as well. And then the smart contracts was really introduced. Uh, Bitcoin had kind of a weak version of that, but Ethereum was the first one to explore that deeply. And that's the idea that you're embedding when an event happens within the supply chain, the smart track, card track can be automatically configured. It's a pretty powerful uh, concept whereby you can start to automate actions based on uh, very reliable uh, discussion of events that's happening in the supply chain. There's this whole discussion about what belongs on the supply chain and off. As I mentioned, it's, it's pretty expensive in terms of uh, compute power uh, to, to um, store things on the supply chain and uh, to, to, to do on uh, these smart contracts. So people are kind of figuring out now a lot of this stuff maybe should be off the supply chain, but what uh, on the blockchain and what belongs off. And the last thing, and you'll see this as we talk through the, what the various folks on the panels here are doing, blockchain, with the exception of cryptocurrencies, it rarely stands alone. It's almost always combined with other technologies to get something really interesting done. So now, where is blockchain useful? Uh, Michael touched on this a bunch, where there's lack of trust, you've got unknown uh, suppliers, and, and you want to start working with them quickly instead of having to go through a long, drawn-out uh, vetting process, where you've got many parties who want to uh, see the same single version of the truth. And we've seen other people tackle this problem through a centrally managed uh, network architecture, uh, where you know everyone plugs into the same network, um, but that has its own limitations. This is a way uh, that you can make it sort of more open. 
Uh, and that helps with disputes a lot, because now that you've got this immutable supply chain, there's a record that sits between us that says, this is what happened, we all agree, and nobody can change that. So it really reduces the amount of time spent arguing about what actually happened. Um, and then also where there are uh, serial steps of paperwork, there's a ton of that in the supply chain, still uh, depending a lot on paper or emails if it's not paper. And, um, and so uh, that also uh, is a valuable place. And also where the reliability and the visibility of the events, you want to reliably record events and you know, record the chain of custody and things like that. Whenever auditability is important, and this could be in highly regulated supply chains or where you want social responsibility, like say, we want to know that these diamonds did not come from a, 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 you know, an illegal source and supporting a conflict. That would be just one example of provenance, and you can do those kinds of things with supply chain. Last but not least, whatever fraud and tampering is a, and data tampering is a problem, right? Because supply chains are great. You got all of these people uh, watching that data and making sure only valid data goes in there and nobody can mess with it. So uh, those are kind of the characteristics. And uh, to wrap up, well, this is a slide from Microsoft, which you can't read, but it's, just, it's a whole bunch of use cases. It's probably one-tenth or one-fiftieth of what people are looking at out there. Um, IBM's got a list probably longer than that. So the applications, we've talked about chain of custody tracking. This is traceability, anti-counterfeiting, and those kinds of things is great. Uh, for, for, for keeping track of what's going on as stuff moves through the supply chain. For global trade enablement, so you've got uh, lots of documentation that could be moved from paper onto the blockchain to help things go faster. As well, uh, you know, things like tendering loads, so we all agreed this is, this is what we've agreed to. And even things like at, at the ports, something like 20% of bookings on ocean carriers don't, don't show up. So there are people trying to, and that's really expensive headache for the, for the uh, people who run the ports and the carriers, people are trying to solve problems like that with the supply chain. Supply chain finance and, and trade uh, finance are another big area. I know IBM's doing a bunch of stuff. Microsoft did, a, did this standby letter of credit, which is uh, where, this is where the letter of credit's because you don't trust the supplier, so you put a bank in between. The standby letter of credit says, okay, now I've got to have my bank, I don't trust your bank, and so these things get complicated and supply chain can help um, really speed that up. Spot markets and marketplaces uh, for our shared resources. This is where like, uh, we all agree that here's the rate, and later on we say, well, you told me something else, a common place to store it. We talked about social responsibility, cargo security and theft, so you really are confident in where your stuff is, uh, tracking your assets, contract management people are talking about, and uh, also know your customer. This is a lot of really interesting things going on in um, ID and having a very secure ID, a verified ID of who you're dealing with. So that's my uh, quick run through of the kinds of things that you're seeing in supply chain. Thanks, Jordan. Thank so, hi, I'm Bridget McDermott. Taking a cue from Michael, I'll give you just a little bit about my background before I ended up here at IBM um, doing all of the incredibly fun stuff that we're doing right now with blockchain. My first job out of college was programming EDI in COBOL. My biggest fear is that people are still using the code that I wrote. <laughs> My hope is that we can use blockchain to change that. I see blockchain as being a real transformative opportunity because it's not looking at this from one angle. Right? It's solving this problem of trust, as both of Michael and Bill have talked about. And in doing so, we solve both a social problem and a financial problem. Right? We're solving the problem of inefficient processes, and we're solving the problem of processes that hurt people and hurt businesses with the fraud, with the illness, et cetera. So, Why is blockchain interesting for supply chain? Well, when you think about supply chain, historically, there have been three key areas of problem that people have looked at. And, you know, I'm a little bit over the top in saying that Marco Polo had these three problems, but I don't think it's that far from the truth, right? The issue of data visibility. What am I, what am I transporting and what state is it in? The process optimization. What's the best way to get it from the place where it started to the place where somebody wants it to be? 
and have it arrive in the condition that I want it to arrive in. And finally, demand management, which most people think of as supply management. How do I take a product that I want to ship and get it to someone, rather than thinking about it as, what does my customer want to buy, and how do I deliver on that need? So these three problems, if you talk to anyone in supply chain, they've been working on them. Probably most people alive today not working on them for millennial, but working on them for decades. And the interesting thing is, when you talk to someone about blockchain being a great solution to these, they say, well, but I don't understand why blockchain solves the problem. We can solve these problems. And my question then is, well, if we can solve the, whoops, if we can solve these problems, why haven't we? And the answer to that is that even though we have the technology to do digitization, we have the top technology to do data management, we have the technology to do distributed systems, we don't have, or we haven't had, the technology for people to trust that the information that they share is being used in a way that doesn't benefit their competitors more than it benefits them, right? And so we have the ability to solve these problems, but we haven't because we're missing one puzzle piece, right? Like, you know how you build a big 1,000 piece puzzle and it's absolutely gorgeous, like sunset on the water and there's like a seagull flying over and then like right in the middle, there's that one black spot because it was like lost on the floor or something and it's really frustrating because you don't have the full puzzle. It doesn't work. And that's what we have with supply chain right now, is it doesn't work because we're missing not the digitization, not the data sharing, not the data management. We're missing the trust. So if we have trust, what does that mean? Well, that means we can really start looking at use cases across supply chain. We can say, let's look at workflow. There's $600 billion of fraud happening in trade every year. And I don't even want to know where that money is being spent once the bad actors have it. But that's saying, if you want to send a container of roses from Nairobi to Rotterdam, why should it take you three and a half weeks to do it with one week in port getting your paperwork ready, one and a half weeks on sea, and another week in port getting the rest of your paperwork done? That information could be readily available. We can start getting rid of under invoicing and inter under invoicing and over invoicing. We can really transform what happens. Supply chain visibility, know what things are, where they are. Trade finance, we talked a little bit about that. My favorite right now, and you guys might have heard about the announcement that IBM made in, in August, and the ones that we made earlier this year in June and last year in October, we've been working with Walmart originally and then more suppliers and retailers, Dole, Driscoll's, Golden State Foods, Kroger, McCormick, McLean, Nestle, Unilever. Um, I always miss one and I think it's always a different one. But trying to bring everybody together to say, can we collaborate now that we have trust? Can we collaborate on solving this problem that everybody wants to solve? The problem that says 400,000 people die every year from food-related illnesses. 3,000 of them in the U.S., with healthcare costs in the U.S. costing close to a billion dollars for food illnesses, with somewhere between 15 and 40 billion dollars worth of money being made on fraud for food. There are bad actors in the system, and it's a small number, and there are a tremendous number of good actors. But when we say a tremendous number, we're talking about 30,000 retailers, we're talking about a million suppliers, we're talking about 500 million farmers. How do you get that kind of scale together? Not to mention the four, five, seven billion customers. How do you get that scale together with trust? You haven't been able to do it before now because all we solved before was how do you share the information, not how do you feel comfortable sharing the information. So. As you think about these blockchain networks, it's great, right? We can transform the world. We have the digital technology, and now we have the trust technology. But at the end of the day, you also have to have a solution that's actually gonna work for you. 
right? Blockchain isn't perfect. It doesn't say, okay, I can deliver you trust in a box. It has to be built. It, it's a tool that you can use to build trust in. And building a governance model and building a system that has technical capabilities, ecosystem capabilities, and business capabilities that match the business needs of what we're doing is critical. So I, I'm a Sloan alum, so I love coming here. This is super fun. And what I took away from my time at Sloan is you need to understand the business you're trying to change, not the processes that exist today, but what the actual goals of the participants in the business are. And if you think about that, and you think about that in alignment with the technology that we're developing, you start asking questions about reliability, right? From a technology perspective, do you have reliability, scalability, security? Is this going to work 24 seven? People need to eat all the time. I mean, look at what happens when there's a natural disaster. It becomes clear very fast how fragile our food system can be. What happens with the ecosystem? How do you get people engaged? Governance, what are people signing up for? Who owns the data? Who can permission the data? Who can decide what happens to the data? And business, what does this mean for your business? Because don't start using blockchain just because it's sexy. And it is sexy, but that's not the reason they use it. The reason is that it's gonna change business. Okay. Uh, I'm here today to talk a little bit more in the weeds, um, some use cases on how to leverage IoT and blockchain um, to digitize, digitize your supply chain. So I'll go over a few um, specific use cases that we're working on at Chronicled as well as um, with a consortium that we co-founded called the Trusted Internet of Things Alliance. Um, so I, again, very interested in kind of your point on the... the uh, necessity of community building and ecosystems in the blockchain space. So it doesn't just exist as a technology in and of itself, um, but there's an, an important uh, aspect that I don't think is necessarily covered, um, which is the importance of you know building a, a global protocol or kind of standard system of standards by which we can all communicate with blockchain. So topic number one is just a, a brief overview on the Trusted Internet of Things Alliance. Um, Number two goes into kind of the idea of uh, registration and verification of uh, an asset in the supply chain with tracking of gold or conflict minerals. Um, number three is leveraging kind of an IoT device or sensor. So in this case, a, uh, a temperature logging sensor for in the pharmaceutical supply chain. And or that's number three. Let's see. And number four is um, kind of the tracking of serial numbers in also the, the pharmaceutical supply chain. Um, so who am I? Uh, again, I'm Sam. A little bit about Chronicled. So we were founded in 2014 with the mission of interfacing uh, real world objects uh, with blockchain. So we started in fine art and actually, I don't know, you know who here has heard of Chronicled? Raise of hands, not many. So we're a West Coast company, but we started um, actually in sneakers and uh, luxury goods. So we were faced with the problem of how do we uniquely identify a real world object on a blockchain? And we got into actually embedding cryptographic microchips into sneakers, which is kind of an odd, uh, you know, uh, two different spaces that you wouldn't expect that. But we did that um, and moved on from that to smart supply chain solutions, so the natural progression from just the registration and verification of assets to transfer of custody, um, ledgering and attesting to data, and then powering machine-to-machine -machine interactions. So um, as you can read here, uh, we're again very, we've been committed from the beginning to the open source community in developing kind of global standards and protocols um, to interface IoT devices and sensors with blockchains. Um, and just an overview again of our products, and I won't go into it too much, I don't have much time, but mainly on the software side, blockchain adapters, so um, integration of ERP systems and kind of uh, standard identification models, so like weak identities, serial numbers, barcodes and QR codes and registration of those, um, you know, all the way up into actually producing our own cryptographic hardware um, or, or helping companies to do that as well. 
So the first topic in terms of ecosystem building, the Trusted Internet of Things Alliance we put together about a year ago, um, companies like Bosch, Cisco, Foxconn, et cetera, um, with the mission of working together as an ecosystem of startups um, and large enterprises to establish a global protocol and system of standards. Um, our belief is that if we're all speaking different languages in this space, it, it, we will um, you know, not have the added benefits of interoperability across solutions. Um, the main kind of five protocol functions that we developed at Chronicled and then moved into the Trusted IoT Alliance were again registration and verification of an IoT device or sensor, and then transfer of that object or sensor, so transfer of custody if you think of, um, you know, digital VIN number and uh, disintermediating the DMV or something like that, um, ledgering data, so more data attestation use cases, and then um, the wallet or machine-to-machine -machine, uh, use cases. So, you know, imagine a, a drone landing on a charging station and, and uh, making a payment to that charging station. So uh, we've developed kind of the APIs and, and primitives for these kinds of uh, basic functions. Um, and then, you know, I'll go into use cases of how we've used them and built business cases on top of them. So the first with just simple registration and verification went into, you know, provenance of fine art or, again, a Jordan or Yeezy sneaker. Um, more specifically, so in uh, the gold use case or a conflict mineral, um, we both register the serial number that's on the gold, but then also are now putting an encrypted microchip and tamper-proof sticker on that gold that is... Um, you know, destroyed when uh, you peel it off, as well as the box that it's actually sealed in um, has a cryptographic identity. And all of that is uh, registered and tracked to prove kind of the end-to-end the -end provenance of the gold. Um, so you can see just like a simple animation of there's the box with the seal, and on your phone, if you scan the sensor, you see that it has been tampered with, and that um, excur or, you know, event is also registered on blockchain. Uh, Two, so ledgering data and the data attestation use cases. In the pharmaceutical supply chain specifically, um, you know, highly regulated in terms of uh, the temperature parameters between two and eight degrees Celsius, a lot of pharmaceutical drugs need to be kept within this temperature range. Um, you know, sensor data can be tampered with, et cetera. So we've um, co-developed encrypted or cryptographic uh, hardware that's about the size of a credit card that replaces some of the conventional IoT temperature sensors um, that you know, travel with uh, protein-based pharmaceutical drugs in the supply chain. And uh, you can scan that with a mobile device and also see kind of the, uh, the registration of the data on blockchain as well and, and prove that um, the data is accurate. And the last one, so again, in the pharmaceutical space, there's regulation um, both in the EU and the United States, but more specifically the United States, called DSCSA, which requires that all pharmaceutical drugs are um, uniquely identified by 2018. By 2023, there needs to be an interoperable system in place by which uh, manufacturers and distributors and, and so on through the supply chain can pass that data um, down the chain, and it also needs to be anonymous. So we're uh, working in a separate joint venture and, uh, project with uh, Pfizer, Amgen, Genentech, some of the big players, as well as the uh, distributors to, to build a blockchain-based solution to anonymously transfer the serial numbers and identities of pharmaceutical drugs in the supply chain. So again, not necessarily an IoT use case for blockchain, but a, a very simple, uh, well, I mean, obviously complex, but simple use case with serial numbers. So just a little graphic. And then, yeah, thank you. I think I'm a little done with time, so that's a little bit about um, my company and the solutions that we provide. And thank you. Thank you. Hopefully my slides are here. So I'll just tell you a little bit about Mojix. Um, I think this is the old deck, but we have, uh, we have um, about 300 people. Um, we've been building supply chain solutions for some time now. Um, supply chain solutions built around unique identity of goods 
uh, primarily products and assets, and optimizing business processes within an organization, um, whether it's a factory, a uh, distribution center, or a retail store, to take advantage of what we call smart assets or smart products. Um, the, the, the key to our um, smart inventory and assets and kind of our core DNA is, is we spent a lot of time building item ledgers for assets, products, inventory, where we're keeping track of, of these goods at, at individual item level. And we do that uh, primarily using some RFID technology, EPC tracking IDs. Um, we automate the process of capturing all that data. And then we keep track of all the spatial temporal data in a time series format, um, essentially creating a document or a ledger for each individual asset and what's happened to that on a real-time basis. Um, those solutions were primarily based on a single facility. So we're optimizing within a single plant or a single DC or a single store to optimize business processes within those organizations. Um, the, the solution has kind of three elements. There's an infrastructure uh, layer. The infrastructure is how we capture the sensor data off, off the individual items. There's a platform, a cloud platform layer that, that brings all this, ingests all of this data, all this temporal spatial data. And then there's the applications where we make this data useful to our customers. Um, it seemed to us that when we started investigating blockchain applications, that it was a natural extension of what we've been doing for years. Because we've been creating these item ledgers um, within a facility, and we were starting to transfer item ledgers from one facility, like a distribution center, to a retail store. So that, that, le that ledger now is extended beyond the four walls of a physical environment. And it seemed to us that if we combine that with smart contract technology, Bridget had mentioned uh, Marco Polo for visibility and uh, process optimization. I started my first um, supply chain planning company back in 1992. So we had a software company where we were using some constraint-based search algorithms to optimize supply chain planning solutions for supply chain. So I've been doing this for a long time, and I can vouch that for a long time, people have been trying to solve these problems. And uh, we're really focused on a use case that says, okay, what is, what, what is the lowest common denominator in supply chain? And the lowest common denominator is the shipping and receiving functions, because that's the trigger point, the event trigger point that triggers almost everything that triggers financial transactions amongst trading partners. So we said, can we automate, can we digitize the, the actual shipment and receipt of goods in a way that allows us to share data with customers using smart contracts? Think of a smart contract as a smart advanced shipping notice or an ASN um, that you can attach in an automated fashion all the individual items and the item ledgers associated with that advanced shipping notice and on the receiving side, be able to receive those in an automated fashion and take over those, those item ledgers. Um, that's what we've been working on, we think, by combining smart inventory with smart uh, contracts and the blockchain. We, uh, we can really change what people have been, some of these problems people have been trying to solve for a long time. Um, it's not easy. Um, the, sorry, um, the future of the, the supply chains, I mean, my, you know, I, I've, I envision the, the supply chains of the future are going to be much like Uber. You're going to have a bunch of dynamic, driven demand, and you're going to have, and, and, and you're going to have customers that are driving that demand, and so you have to be responsive to that demand on a real-time basis. But instead of you're providing a service, which is people driving around in cars, which represents supply. Supply will be represented by products. And these products 
will, these, these supply chains will be self-organizing, they'll be intelligent, they'll be able to be demand-driven. And all of these things require automation, connectivity, and intelligence applied. But it's, it's, not real, it's not easy as it sounds, because while you have some ambitious goals of improving speed or velocity, more flexibility and uh, agility, uh, improved visibility, self-optimization, self-orchestrating, the challenges associated with doing that with physical goods, you know, the beauty of blockchain is it works perfect for digital assets. Right? Um, think of lots of use cases around digital assets, but now when you start trying to apply it to atoms instead of bits, it gets a lot more complicated. How do I digitize those goods? How do I, um, what are the data standards that we're going to use associated with trading those products amongst trading pro partners and these, these uh, known parties that we do business with? Um, how do I interconnect? And, and uh, what are the, how, do, how does it scale globally? And how do I apply intelligence with this massive amount of new data? And we think, you know, through uh, automated capture of sensor data on smart products, blockchain technology, which, which effectively represents the connective tissue, we think of it more as a, a index of goods that have, you know, it's sort of a skinny index that has pointers to fat repositories off-chain that are maybe permissioned or unpermissioned, private or public. Um, and these massively scalable cloud IoT platforms that Microsoft and Google and uh, uh, Amazon and IBM are building, um, all of these things uh, provide... <laughs> that was for you, Bridget. Sorry. I, I didn't want to leave you out. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and you, now you have all this data available, all this digitized data available, and you can really start applying artificial intelligence and machine learning and do things that, were, that have never been possible, things that we've been talking about since the days of Marco Polo. So that's it. This, the inception for this company came out of a, a, a project I worked on at the Media Lab in 2014. It was a conference we did called Identity, Trust, and Data. And uh, for me, this is my eighth company. Uh, this particular uh, conference we did, I had an epiphany, and the epiphany was about what's a supply chain. And I want to step back and say why. So I really believe what's happened with the internet is this pendulum that swings, okay? Over, on the, over here are the inventors, the creators, the musicians, the artists. Over here are people who buy stuff. And I think what we've looked at for the last 20 years on the internet is essentially an anomaly. I think certain companies have actually done land grabs on the internet, and I started this company to actually help f fix that problem. So next thing is, I'm the last person to talk. I just want everybody to know that supply chain is sexy, and it's fun, and it's about beer. So at, as I started talking about all these use cases, and it all fuzzes over, just think, uh, presentation almost over, beer beer. So that, that will happen later. And interestingly enough, MIT, how many places in the world can this many people come together and, and make something like supply chain sexy? I mean, Jay Forrester was a giant, and I, I think this overhangs everything we do here. Okay, so I want to give you sort of our philosophy on supply chain. Everything's a supply chain. You're a supply chain. Every idea you get is a supply chain. Every idea you got started when you were a little kid. It's the things that you learned. And ultimately, here you are at MIT, you're a student, maybe you're an inventor, maybe you're an entrepreneur, you're a part of a supply chain, okay? Um, we think there's a supply chain for everything, and it's not only physical things, but it's also digital things. So the, the backdrop to everything I'm saying is the pendulum's always swinging. And if it works properly, we'll derive the maximum value out of our lives. So I think this is where supply chain gets really personal, you know? Um, Okay, so blockchain, you know, it's pretty new technology. The epiphany I had at the Identity, Trust, and Data Conference was, wow, that's a technology that should be uh, mined. And, and, and I don't mean in the sense of a miner from a blockchain perspective, but it needed to be mined. So it's a key component in a solution. I, I basically made my career making enterprise solutions that are at scale, the base of internet standards and stuff, so I, I kind of bring that bent to what we try to do. And you know, Bill, uh, when you started off talking about components here, so at Context Labs, 
Uh, we see blockchain as, as an, a key ingredient that goes into a solution. For what we've done, there's this idea of big data ingestion. You've got to ingest, ingest massive amounts of data in real time. You've got to cleanse it and curate it. There's a lot of noisy data. Cryptography is embedded. There's machine learning. We've developed track and trace, fraud detection. All these bits go into making something that somebody buys. So we're not just talking about this thing called blockchain. We're talking about a solution that can actually swing the pendulum back to those who create the value. That's why we're doing it. OK, um, everything that happens is a state. And there's a reason we're called Context Labs. Uh, it's because there's a context, and every state is a ledger event or a transaction, OK? Keep, bear that in mind. And then all states have a connected context. So we bring, I think, a different point of view into what supply chain management is. So this context is, if my clicker would work well. So what's interconnected? And as I roll back to why we did this, we were working for about two years on, on uh, what we call innovation dynamics, which is essentially a network graph of how innovation works in economies and ecosystems. So what we did is we said, OK, for supply chain, each one, think of a network graph, each one of these, these things, who, what, when, and where, these are nodes. The interconnections on those nodes are the edges. So we believe next-gen supply chain solutions integrate blockchain with network graph analytics. And, and this is what we built as a company. OK, so we have seven minutes. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> um, I'm going to give you three examples of deployments we have at Context Labs, OK? And I'll try to go fast. Uh, we do two things. We essentially model and design ecosystems. And that intersects into applications that get built. So we've built something called Innovation Scope that models ecosystems. We've modeled Cambridge versus San Diego for biotech, for example. We've modeled Amsterdam. Uh, our company's based here in Kendall Square and in Amsterdam. And then on the product side, you know, we've got productized solutions that are based on the technology. So three, ref three reference impl implementations I'm going to speak about today. Uh, one is in publishing. It's in books and the printing of books and the supply chain of books. One is in music, and one is in environmental data. Something I don't have time to touch on is work in process, where we've got chain of custody for, for, custody for data veracity for firmware. Every, everybody in here right now has in their pocket millions of, millions of lines of code of firmware. How do we know it's the right firmware? When we're driving an autonomous car, how do we know that what we downloaded is trusted? So I, we think this has a, a great opportunity. So I'm going to talk about the first one, which is physical book publishing. Um, you can see back in March 2016, now I remember this, this inception started at the Identity uh, Trust and Data Conference at the lab. We hacked for two years and then iterated ourselves into a deal with the company that actually, probably most people haven't heard of it, but it's the largest printer of books, magazines, and all that junk you get in your Sunday paper. They print all this stuff. So we, so we did a deal with these guys to... You know, we announced a deal for blockchain-enabled capabilities for publishing. Publishing is super old school. You know, Gutenberg, mid-1400s, OK? So no blockchain in the 1400s. This is what blockchain looks like today. Uh, our solutions deployed in factories around the world with this customer. Uh, they print upwards of 800 million books a year. There's a partnership that's been announced with them, us, and Hewlett Packard, and it's called Intercept from Lakeside Communications. So blockchain's real, you know, like there's this, it's not this ephemeral thing, right? It actually can produce stuff on a big assembly line. I'm gonna go faster. Um, so what happens? You know, when I've talked about the things that come together to make a solution, well, we, we make these dashboards that help you find needles in the haystack for fraud, for example. So when I talk network graph analytics, people who are into that here, you can see the graph. And the graph it has an identity. Uh, the, every every uh, transaction that happens is tracked. And all those things together bring a context, which actually can show us who the bad actors are. I'm going to skip that. OK, music. Music, I, I'm a trustee at Berkeley College of Music. I love music. Uh, I've, I've played music since I was a little boy. Um, there was a cool article on what we did there uh, in Wired, which came out like two days ago. Music industry bands together finally get paid online. This is something we did at our company, which we, we, through in the innovations uh, scope uh, ecosystem development. About 200 members, basically all the streaming players, Spotify, YouTube, et cetera, and all the big labels, OK? Um, what we drove, there's a common theme here, which is interoperability. 
we drove towards uh, what, what we coined the MVI, minimum viable interoperability. This means that data needs to be transportable and trusted in, in, in its own right. And if you do that, composers can get paid uh, through the convoluted permutations of, of supply chain distribution for music. Okay. This one's cool. Um, this one, we've got a partnership with one of the, uh, the world's largest um, NGOs for the environment. I'm going to skip that because I'm out of time. Does this look like blockchain? This is blockchain. Uh, <laughs> blockchain's behind this. Essentially, every type of data that gets ingested, you know, this whole thing about fake news, we say no fake data. So we've deployed blockchain for fake data. There will be no fake data on the environment, and that will, from our perspective, move the pendulum back to those who want to save the planet. Okay, I'm done. I'll skip because I've, I've, I've gone over. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dan. Actually, um, I'm actually going to shoot to the, the two Dans at the end here because, um, Dan Dolls, you, you, you talked about the challenge of taking this, this digital record uh, and, and, and interfacing it with bits and atoms. So, you know, Bitcoin really truly was digital assets, digital, digital uh, stores of value being shifted around. And now we have to interface with this real world. I want the two of you to think about and just to explain how we go from this thing. I, li I like this concept of the perimeter of trust. That the, the, the blockchain is, it, it resolves a trust problem here, but we still have to ensure that the data that's coming into that blockchain is something that we can trust. And Dan, you've got interesting solutions with your graphs that stand half of it. Dan, you know, you, you've, you've grappled with this as well. Just talk to us a little bit about this challenge and, and how do we ensure that there is sort of a standardized approach to it, the collection of the data as it goes into a blockchain? Either one, the Dan and Dan. Dan dolls you first, yeah. I think because we're both Dan. Exactly. It's just, you can just, whoever moves first. Well, this is really, I, I mean, I think this is really the most challenging part of implementing blockchain on supply chain. And, and to a certain extent, even goes beyond blockchain. It's really about, you know, if, if you're interested in global visibility of your, your products and you want to make those products globally available, how do I do that? How do I get real-time data? Um, there is, you know, in the last few years, some things have very have changed fairly radically in terms of embedded sensors, uh, in particular, little passive RFID sensors that can be embedded into goods. Um, today, uh, we embed, uh, we we have uh, projects with several luxury brands like Louis Vuitton, who is embedding sensors within their all of their leather goods. So that, that, that product now has a digital identity. It has a digital signature. And that digital signature can be used to not only authenticate the product and protect the brand, but it also can be used to track and, and manage that product as it goes through the product life cycle post you know, your traditional PLM system, which usually starts at the design process and runs through manufacturing, that product life cycle really extends beyond manufacturing because the product exists through distribution and supply chain, through whatever your, your retail channels are, and ultimately with the, with the consumer itself. Um, so today what we see is, is that most, uh, especially in the retail world because the sensor prices, uh, volumes, uh, the sensor volumes have gone up to, I think it's the uh, RFID sensors are over 10 billion units a year now, which makes it the largest single IC being produced. Um, and prices, you can get uh, fully, uh, uh, full tag with inlays and chips um, printed on a laser printer for less than about five cents a piece now. So it enables you to create and attach digital signatures to these physical things that then can be collected. And that's, that's really important. You can use and authenticate and certify these, these goods uh, and attach them to these processes, these business processes that ultimately can be written to the supply chain. And you know, one thing I, I would just add, and we talked a lot about trust as being the driving factor for a lot of these adoption of blockchain, but it's more than just trust. It's, it's one version of the truth. And, and, and for the most part, what we see is, is a big 
a, a big game changer is, is that one v- version of the truth. Because the, you know, as I, the example I, I used with the shipping receiving, um, it, that works great when everything you, you said you shipped, the other side of the party says I received. But that almost never happens. Um, what happens generally is there's exceptions or claims or chargebacks that occur during this process. And you get into this process of, hey, I shipped you this and um, you said that you didn't receive it all. And, and, and the, the other side of the transaction, the trading partner will say, yeah, I didn't receive it. And they'll say, yeah, well, yes, you did. We shipped it. And it was, yes, you did. No, you didn't. Yes, you did. No, you didn't. And this is the standard process for resolving claims um, in, in, in the supply chain today. And if you can automate that process by digitizing and automating the not only what left and what was received, you can start removing the latency that exists within the supply chain. And, and latency is, 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 there's a lot of, uh, of places for latency, like in the ports, for instance, but there's also a lot of internal processes that create latency as well, and, and that's, you know, th- that keeps you from being able to optimize your supply chains. And yeah, I mean, there's, look at the RFID solution, these, these now high-tech but low-cost, but there's this broader issue in some respect as well about you know, how do we actually trust that data, and you've got this graphical way of thinking about that. Sure. Um, First of all, if it's on the blockchain, it doesn't mean it's truth, you know? Like, it's totally not. Garbage in, um, garbage out. Yeah, right? so, um, I mean, that's a big misnomer about blockchain. Um, our view is that the definition of truth and reality is in a proof which should be cryptographic. So there are multiple proof points for a given event. So we, uh, our API is called Proofwork, so what it does is it looks at different events, and those are configurable. So for the music business, you know, what we did with the Open Music Initiative is establish this API called Minimum Viable Interoperability 1.0. And that has elements of what, con- what constitute truth. And so when a given song, take a, an MP, MP4 or MP3 file, goes to the supply chain, as it gets registered, there are multiple points that say, yes, that's the real thing. And then those are bound into, essentially, we call the thing an oblet, which is a live piece of content. And it's cryptographically bound with n amounts of proof points. So you ensure the validity and the certainty of, of your thing or your data. So, you know, we think there's a way you approach it from a computer science point of view to do that. And we're approaching real time. I mean, we've got blockchain implementations that run about 80x the throughput of, for example, what Bitcoin does, you know, what the Bitcoin uh, environment does. So I think the real time nature, and you guys have been at this for, for years, you know, um, but part of what we're doing is is we're, we're not benef- we're not burdened by the fact that you've already got a company and you have to actually you know keep shipping and stuff. So new ideas can actually be deployed in a way that I think wasn't thought of before. You know, so that so we talked about this yesterday at the hack for climate thing. How do we ensure that 17 different cities when they do their hacks are going to actually have transportability on their data? Well, let's ensure that we have a common proof on the data, and then we can share it. You know, we can trust the data. Yeah, Yeah, just to add to that, um, so a couple angles. One, I want to give one more example, which will help illuminate how physical events can get recorded reliably on a blockchain. And some of you may have heard of the company Everledger. So what they started was in tracking diamonds. Uh, to ensure that they're not conflict diamonds, right? That's the purpose of it, to make sure you're not funding uh, illegal mines. So the first thing that happens is at, at the mine, they take something like 48 different measurements with these pretty fancy machines. So this is one extreme where you're willing to invest in these high-tech machines that can do, uh, I don't even know the types of analysis, how it reflects light and the weight of it and all these different things that are hard to fake. That all gets digitally signed by some uh, trusted person too, as well as the machine. And I'm gonna get back to that about, do you trust what the machine says? At the other extreme of the stuff that uh, Dan Doles was talking about, which is you got a five cent RFID chip, that's not gonna do its own digital signature. It's just not, doesn't have the horsepower. But the reader potentially could, could be authenticated because that's, that's actually the reader, it's actually in this location. And, it, and so what we see is, 
identity management, which we usually think about as, as confirming the identity of people, is also being extended to machines, right? So this is the machine that um, has this private key, so we know it's this machine, only it can sign this data, and now you can um, be confirmed of, of that, and that together with potentially uh, digital signatures by people mm -hmm. who you trust can start to create data that says, yeah, this, we, this data, as, as Dan said, has multiple proof points that says this thing actually happened. So there's a, there's a, a term that I've been using a bit, it's, it comes from a, a good friend of mine, Pindar Wong. Some of you have read the article that, I, that he and I wrote for the Harvard Business Review, and Pindar is uh, working on some standardization approaches to supply chain uh, management through the blockchain. And he's come up with the term KYM which is a, a play on KYC. Those of you who know your financial uh, uh, services needs is know your customer. This is know your machine, right? And, and it is, it's interesting that this concept of identity is gonna be critical. But I think Dan said something, Dan, Dan Harpel, that is important. This, these cryptographic proof points are really powerful, but there has to be this, this social accord around what they represent. It, the, 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 one of the things that's really interesting about the blockchain is it's not, it, it forces us to recognize that the truth is always a subjective thing. It's just that there's a consensus around that, what, what that is. And it's a very liberating concept when you get to it. The thing is though, we need to find this consensus. And when we move outside of the chain and the consensus process, we need actually sort of to find these standards. So I'd like maybe, you know, Bridget, you could talk about it. Because I mean, you, you're there at Hyperledger, which in itself is an, an attempt to try to Sort of come up with things like standards and so forth. I mean, what's going on in the broader industry, both you know within industries themselves, but even sort of the broader community of people working blockchains, to figure out what are the standards we're going to use so that we can take things like these cryptographic proofs, these RFID standards, and say this is what we're going to all agree upon to be the basis for the for the stuff that's going into the blockchain. I think about what we're doing, I think about it always at two levels, right? So what is the underlying blockchain foundation? And then what is the solution that we're building on top of it? And I think within each of these, we need to be thinking about standards and interoperability. And with blockchain, it's more important than it's ever been with any technology before. Because blockchain is so fundamentally based on how do we engage this broad, diverse, untrusting group of folks. And when you do that, you need standards, you need interoperability, you need access, you need, it, I mean, it's an ease of use problem that's not just about the interface, it's about the entire user experience. So if we start with the underlying layer, um, when IBM started looking about two years ago at how we wanted to get into blockchain, we thought about from an enterprise perspective. And we said, well, having worked with a lot of enterprises, the most important thing for us is open source and open governance, right? Open source is great if you can see everything, but if one person is making the decision on what is in that open source as the CEO or whatever of a company, I don't feel confident that I have sort of control over what could be happening with the foundation of my technology. And so Linux Foundation, obviously gold standard in building out open source, um, that was, we were excited to join with, I think at the time, 17 other companies and now 150 or something like that who were building out open source, open governance. Um, but that in and of itself, right, is not enough, right? You, if, if, you are building, if you're building out blockchain but reinventing everything that goes around it, you will never be successful. And so you need to be thinking about how does this standard, whatever it is, and it, I mean, Hyperledger Fabric is not the only option out there, but it's the one we prefer because of open source and open governance. But having built it on this standard, how do you think about interoperability with an SAP network, with EDI, with yeah. all of these networks that already exist, and how do you leverage the fact that that happens? The same thing, though, happens in the solution layer, where you start saying, why would I possibly reinvent the wheel? You know, why not take, if I'm, you know, I talked a little bit about food safety. There is a GS1 standard that has existed for decades in consumer products and food. And we're actually gonna be, I'll pre-announce this tonight. We're making an announcement tomorrow with us, Microsoft, a few others. Why not use GS1? Because it's a really good standard and a lot of people are already using it. And if you 
use that as the basis of how you're thinking about blockchain, you simplify what you're doing. And so as we think about building out these networks, it's less about reinventing how to do things and more about concentrating on taking all of the things that have been done so well before. I mean, my favorite thing about blockchain itself is that it wasn't actually a great technology innovation. It, it was a brilliant innovation, so don't get me wrong, but it took a lot of cryptography that already exists, a lot of distributed systems, a lot of data management, and it sort of went like this and was like, wow, it would work differently if I turned it all around and did that. And so we've got this foundation that even though blockchain is this new technology that we can experience and we can use in different ways, it's not like something like quantum computing where there's 25 people who actually understand and you need like super cooled <laughs> nitrogen to make it work. This is something where in every university, in every company, there are people who understand the cryptography, who understand the distributed system, who understand the management, and can think about how to make it better by pulling in existing standards, existing products, existing capabilities. And that is gonna get us to the scale because that is what blockchain success is about, is building on this momentum so that we are building both the blockchain infrastructure so that the tools, the capabilities to develop solutions, to, to develop the governance, to run, to operate these systems, and then to the solutions that actually use them. We need to be solving these problems, not reinventing the wheel. Okay. Um, you know, it was interesting, I like, I like the fact that you sort of talked through the, 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 the multiple facets that go into the blockchain and how there's components to it. And I, I do think that sometimes uh, there's a simplistic view of it as, as a sort of a monolithic technology. And, and it's all these different pieces. And what that therefore means is it's, to me, a social technology, which is to say that it's a mechanism. And the game theoretic components of blockchain are arguably more important than anything else, right? Particularly in the Bitcoin world where it's an incentives game. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an attempt to sort of play with what people will or don't want. So there's this... Um, socialization aspect to the building of a blockchain. You can't just put it into nowhere and hope it's going to work. You need everybody to agree to the rules uh, at, at, at some point, right? At, certainly at the beginning. So Sam, I was thinking because you know, you've been in this you know, fairly early on and you've, you've, you've tried out a number of these different implementations. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that experience has been in terms of hurting all the cats, in terms of getting all of the participants within a chain or within an ecosystem, within an industry to to participate, what do, you, what do we need to do to uh, you know, realize some of these goals in terms of that gathering of, of, of consensus to actually participate? Yeah, certainly. I mean, so kind of going off of what IBM is doing, we, we similarly believe in more in kind of the specific use case of IoT and blockchain and even more specifically in the pharmaceutical supply chain. Um, you know, even to do something which seems as, as simple of a proof of concept or, or pilot for, to um, solve a problem in terms of traceability involves a, a huge degree of education and so socialization of the technology. This first step of just, you know, going to the FDA and educating them. Um, sorry if anyone is here from there, but, uh, you know, what is this? What is blockchain and what is the value? Um, for it, and then beyond that, uh, what are the implications? So bringing in kind of the, the major players, whether they be manufacturers, distrib distributors, end users, hospitals, pharmacies, um, just the general public, um, and bringing them together in kind of the model that we've seen working in the, the larger blockchain ecosystem, but as well in, in these niche kind of industry verticals are kind of the consortia building model. So bringing together um, all of the, the, the large companies and even that in terms of like a social game is fairly complicated. So you get companies that are historically competitive with each other and start talking about, you know, things where we're, we're putting all our data in one place. Um, how, how do you convince people to, to start to buy into something like that? So again, kind of working together under, um, you know, the umbrella of uh, an ecosystem or a shared common goal or consortium. Um, has been the model that we've taken, and it's primarily, yeah, again, in the pharmaceutical space. So, so one of the, my, it's, I wouldn't call it a P, because it's really sort of stretching, because this is a, um, a, a seminar around 
the word supply chains. But I sometimes wonder whether using the word is in fact limiting. I, I, I actually think that um, the most exciting way to think about um, this technology, or any technology for that matter, is, is what different world it might allow us to imagine rather than just how it might solve an existing problem. And I tend to think that when we sort of sometimes talk to companies about their supply chain or you know, my supply chain, it's a very limited concept that says it's me and my, and, and my member companies. And so there's a conversation around how the blockchain can help the provenance and the coordination amongst this existing set of actors. But you know, in a world of additive manufacturing, 3D printing, uh, you know, the, all the Industry 4.0 ideas that are coming up at IoT World, um, one can imagine a much more fluid environment where suppliers are in and out of these arrangements in a much more you know, um, um, dynamic and, and rapid basis. How do we, and I'm actually putting this to all of you, so I'd just like you to weigh in, sort of your, like, you know, put your crystal ball in front of you and, and imagine where this future looks like. What does the future look like in terms of this, you know, merging of things like 3D printing with you know, IoT and the blockchain. Where, do we, where does this all play out? And do we end up with something that's not really a supply chain? It's maybe a demand chain. It's a, it's a very responsive kind of world. It's, I'll open that up, but uh, maybe we'll just go to another. Yes, Sam, go, go for it. So I'm actually on the board of a company that's interfacing additive manufacturing and blockchain as well. So I'd love yeah, to go us, into go, it. Go so it's it. all... We started with like a really simple problem um, in the consumer product space, trying to build a razor, a women's razor, um, and kind of there are multiple solutions. Do we go, you know, buy a factory and pull the model of like Harry's? I don't know that brand. So they basically own their supply chain, um, and and looked at additive manufacturing and, and scaling that technology and kind of bringing the cost of materials down. And coming from like my personal background in blockchain wanted to investigate how could we decentralize um, additive manufacturing, so having uh, models that might perhaps involve fractional ownership of machines and, and leasing of machines, um, and then fractional payout of kind of the, the use of those machines or the IP or, uh, surrounding um, you know, designs that are used for them to create consumer products or uh, aerospace parts or uh, automotive parts. Um, so we've kind of moved into a model of decentralized additive manufacturing that not only or doesn't rely on kind of a, a specific geographic location, but more of a distributed, decentralized um, model of producers that respond to, to things like demand in a certain area or, um, you know, material availability or things like that. So it's definitely something where I could it's, see. It's also a scary scenario for companies that have built their entire future on the expectation that they will always be GE's supplier of whatever service, right? I mean, what do you, what do you, see, what do you see in it? With it though. They yeah. can? I mean, the, the way that I've been looking at this is when we're building out blockchain solution here, we're not building a blockchain s supply chain solution. We're building an ecosystem that leverages blockchain. And I think that intent actually changes to what you're talking about. Because rather than saying, I have one company and I want to understand how their supply chain works and I'm going to follow it, which is more traditional software development, right? Like, what is the, pro what is the problem on your supply chain? It's saying, how do we make the ecosystem itself more efficient by sharing information across the ecosystem? Now, I think there's, one thing that we haven't talked about tonight is permission versus permissionless, right? It's a whole other For, rabbit hole. It's, it's a different rabbit hole, but I think it's important as we talk about this, which is when you, when you have an ecosystem, a business network of folks participating, you have the option to know who those participants are or to not know who the participants are. And I think that in a case where you have sort of the physical exchange of goods that we've been talking about, because you need to, you know, as Dan said, the data itself is not true, it's trusted, right? So you, you know that somebody is telling you they're going to send you a bunch of organic bananas, but until, if you, unless you can actually check that they're organic, you have to either, you have to trust their word. And if you're trusting their word, you need to know who they are because you need to know their reputation. And so when we think about building out this kind of ecosystem, an ecosystem where when we are transmitting something other than a digital item, we need that history of behavior. 
If we're transmitting just a digital item, we can deal with a permissionless system and say, this transaction ends as soon as it happens, and the value that is exchanged is sufficient for me to be happy with that transaction. But by thinking about the ecosystem itself as an ecosystem rather than a chain, and thinking about it as people having, I, I like thinking about it on the reputation side because you start saying the behavior and the interactions are all due to good behavior and bad behavior is punished. And so people who perform well are the ones who are able to create more business, are able to satisfy their clients more quickly, more effectively. And so you actually you know, get rid of all of these inefficiencies that exist in the network now where people are able to cover up bad business behavior by a large size or by a name that people trust for one reason or another. And you get down to, I'm going to let the behavior of the player speak for itself. And that is going to, by definition, create the most efficient supply chain because the right parties are going to be able to connect. Uh, Dan, Dan's been yeah, leaning think, in, in that. Yeah, just, uh, Dan's getting all so, excited. So like, this is sort of like the <laughs> radical statement, I think. Um, so the supply chain implies this linearity, I think, you know. And for, when we do fraud detection, it's got nothing to do with linearity. It looks at the network graph. Yeah. So that's how we do it. And let's step back. And, and when I said 20 years of our lives will be an anomaly, and I think this is the reason why. The, the Internet is designed as a ruggedly decentralized system. It's inherently designed for peer-to-peer -peer transactions and communications. At the end of the day, there's only two things, a put and a get, right? That's what, that's what exists. Mm -hmm. So why would blockchain actually, help, I, I think, helps chop the man down. And the man is Amazon and Apple. And I mean, this is kind of, uh, think about this. When you buy a book from Amazon, and if I'm Pearson as a publisher, I don't know who bought my books. How dare they, you mm -hmm. know? I think blockchain makes that go away. It allows people to have one-on-one -on -one relationships. KYC, know your consumer, I think really matters, with who they buy things from. And when we cut out that, that middleman, we cut out a big swath of the pendulum, of the margin, which means more people create cool music. They make great products because we're not paying the delivery guy. And you know, I think ultimately this peer-to-peer -peer ecosystem will develop. And I mean, I, I don't think it's too brash to say that all great companies stumble and some many fail, you know? Can, can we get there with a permissioned system or does that imply permissionless? I hate to put you on the spot on that, but this is one of the things that, you know, is it, is it I mean, in some respects, Bridget's suggesting that we actually get there by a permission. I, I think so, one, yeah. You can. Okay. Because there's an identity. Now, I think, you know, just as like a thing has a proof and, and an encrypted identity, so could I, so could we. We could have multiple ones, personas, right, that buy things and sell things. Mm -hmm. And those have permissions. I think the permissionless thing is sort of the utopian uh, blockchain school of thought. I mean, ultimately, things happen because we allow each other to share things with each other. We agree, we've agreed that we'll come here, you know? I mean, that's a permissioned blockchain. We've agreed on mm -hmm. that, sort of so, implicitly. Yeah, just, just to add to uh, this conversation, if you take the long-term view of supply chains and what's happened over the last several decades, this idea of compression of cycle times, uh, in, first of all, in production, right? And so that means, how can I make a smaller batch at the same efficiency that I do a large batch at scale? That's part of what you're getting to with the 3D printing. Now, um, and, and people have been working on that, uh, same, say, even with shipments and everything, it turns out that the, the, the more efficiently you can switch over and make, make a new batch, uh, the less waste you're going to have uh, in, in the system. We see that with product life cycles as well, and product life cycles get shorter and shorter and shorter. So people have been uh, already looking at, um, and we, we did some research on the age of uh, rapid startup and hyper-specialization. So there are these companies out there that help startups to like really quickly find manufacturing resources and a sales channel. And you know, there, I, I interviewed one company that had like four people and they had so many millions of dollars in business, you know, because they were able to just outsource everything. So that phenomenon has already been happening, even pre-blockchain. Pre I think the question that you're asking now is, is this question of discovery and trust. So I want to find suppliers who can supply stuff and, or third parties. And there are networks out there uh, that are centralized that try to establish some level of 
discovering suppliers and understanding their capabilities and having a level of trust quickly. Um, but we're talking now about using a more decentralized approach which, in which the trust, uh, if you do the right techniques, you can get even a higher level of, of trust based on reputation, what they've done in the past, people who, who you know this is the person who's, who's actually saying, this is a good company, I've worked with them, and you know that that's a true statement. Just one, one aside there. Um, one of my colleagues last year started telling people that his goal was to raise global GDP, right? That that's what he thought he could do by using blockchain because you can increase the actual participation in the global economy, right? More companies that now have barriers due to small size, et cetera, can participate. And so I went to our mutual boss and I said, I think that's great. And I think he should be measured on that. <laughs> so, we'll bonus, wait bonus tied to raising global, global GDP. Exactly. That's, that's One other point on that. If people have been talking about blockchain in the third world, for example, to give identity to people who don't have documentation, either the refugees or they're just too poor, and, and other means to help a broader swath of the economy actually participate more meaningfully in the economy. So I think it actually... Yeah, the, the, you can start to get you know, excited. I think, I think one of the things that's it's also uh, important to have a bit of a check, right? I mean, the, the, the blockchain is not going to, uh, in and of itself, bring world peace. Um, but just to cite something here, so we have actually in this room four people who attended uh, the Hack for Climate last night that Dan alluded to. We've got one over there, one here, another one over there. Um, and, and, and then sure enough, at this event that I, I hosted last night, a workshop of people working on a, uh, a, a, thinking through ideas that might be associated with a hackathon that's gonna be held at the, uh, the COP23 climate change um, event in Bonn this year, the big annual UN climate change conference. Um, we indeed looked at how we could um, tackle climate change with, uh, with the blockchain. And the thing that I, the reason we, I think we can do this is because the, you're not fixing, uh, you, you're not dealing with renewable energy, you're not you know, producing forestation, but you are creating this capacity for collective action that we haven't had before. And it's the, 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 the uh, international, so the intergovernmental um, program for climate change, I think it's called this IPPC or something, was created in 1988. And it took until 2015 to have the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Not because we didn't know about the problem, what to do about it, but we couldn't collectively come together. So on that note, I just want to just sort of maybe sort of like dive in this week, you know, Bridget and I, just before we came here, had a kind of a really rich conversation about some of the things that could happen. And the reality is we focus a lot on those obvious questions of, of the climate change, of climate change, you know, obviously more renewable energy, forestation. But in reality, the big challenge is just simply how do we make what we have with less or make more with less? And that, in fact, also helps us increase world GDP. So this, this core question of efficiency is actually this common goal as the humanity itself should be pursuing. So again, crystal ball it a bit here, you know, what could we do with this technology to sort of tackle some of these, you know, really interesting new ways of managing, you know, more with less or just the creative use of, of materials that might actually build for both a better world and a, um, uh, a safer world. Yeah. Throw it out there. Who wants to? I mean, I, I'm, I we sort of got, <laughs> yeah, we got warmed up a little bit, but I get really excited about this. It, so one of the things as we've been looking at food safety that we see is that one third of all food globally is wasted. That's pretty horrible when there are starving people. But when you think about the fact that with population growth, and I'm gonna get these numbers wrong, so don't quote me on it, but it's something like by 2050, we have to produce as much food as we've produced in the entirety of human history. We actually probably can't do that. Nor, from a climate change perspective, should we do that. Instead, we should stop wasting one third of the food that is actually produced. And as a meat eater, it would be really good if we would stop wasting meat because that's a huge contributor to global warming. And so the question is, can we use blockchain and the efficiencies that it creates in this network to actually solve the problem not by 
you know, forcing coal bans, right? Like things that we probably should do. But can we do it by getting rid of the waste that is costing all of us money, that is harming people and is harming the planet? So for me, it just, it seems like a no-brainer. It's not something to the point that you were on that we're going to be able to do overnight because the technology has to be built out, the solutions have to be built out. But the investment to me is worth it because you're solving both that social cost and that financial cost, right? I think I said before I learned at Sloan that you, know, you have to solve real business problems. The other thing I learned at Sloan is you actually have to have a business case that closes. People don't pay money for things that they lose money on, at least not for a very long time. And so if you can have a business case that convinces people, actually delivers on a financial benefit, and at the same time provides real social good, and whether that is you know, making food safer, reducing climate change, reducing fraud in business d deliveries, any of that with a business case by using not just blockchain, but blockchain, all of the data, the IoT, the analytics, the graphs, the predictive in it, all of this stuff, bringing it together, that to me is why I get so excited about what it is I do. Is because I really think, uh, our CEO has said, <coughs> blockchain will transform transactions the way the internet transformed communications. I think that's happening. And if you think about the impact of transforming communications, huge. Transactions are even more fundamental to our daily life. It is going to change the way that we live. The question is how and how fast. Again, I invite any other comments, but one thing I'm just going to do is a bit of a teaser about that. What happens to finance? You know, how, do, 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 like, Foxconn is using a, a blockchain uh, to incentivize its suppliers to participate in this, and rather than uh, offer them 90-day you know, repayment terms, it's now being able to, because of that information that it's now got, offer them 15-day repayment terms. That's, that's actually bypassing banks. That's now, you know, liquidity and working capital as something that the suppliers themselves work amongst themselves. Anyway, just throw that. Anybody have thoughts on this big, bold, brave future that we might be heading into? Dan? Either Dan? Go ahead, Dan. It's your, it, take plural. I've already, this Dan has already spoken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can keep talking. I, I, I like listening to you. Um, there's, uh, you, you know, I think trade finance is, is ripe for innovation. Um, there's a lot of pieces that need to be put in place, but if you just look at the cost of financing, you know, commerce across uh, in these, these, you know, a flat world, um, global economies across borders, there's a tremendous amount of inefficiency, especially um, lower at the, at the lower tiers of the supply chain. These these you know mom and pop shops that get get cost pushed down to them and effectively find, having to finance their inventory to supply the bigger bigger manufacturers, whether it's a, a clothing manufacturer in Malaysia or it's. Uh, you know, it's a parts manufacturer for some, some components. So, so the ability to improve trade commerce finance is, is, is it's a huge, I, I can't remember, I, I don't remember what the exact number is, but if you just think about all of the AR factoring that occurs for the small guys who have to essentially go to banks or even more expensive outlets to finance all of their uh, their working capital needs in order to supply product that they eventually will get paid for, but they need money in the meantime. It's, it's, it's enormous, and, and, and I think blockchain can change that significantly. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's you know, a lot of interest, and in a, a lot of the things you see about supply chain um, is, is geared around supply chain finance, and you're already starting to see you know, stand, the traditional standby letters of credit um, being digitized and, and put on the blockchain. It's also a way to so incent incentivize and monetize yeah. the actual blockchain development, right? There's like a real tangible money-based use case. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Bill? I've got, I've got, well, so if, when we're talking about finance, uh, supply chain finance, there's uh, one part of it is, is um, uh, finance based on a, a, an approved uh, invoice that's approved for payment, okay? So people have been trying to 
because fact factoring is very expensive, right? So there are a bunch of uh, centralized networks out there today that help try to solve that problem so that they can make, uh, basically you can sell, sell, sell your receivables to a broader audience than just your local banks and get much better rates on them uh, and or to allow buyers to plug in, as you said, um, uh, offers to their suppliers that, hey, at a, at a discount or, or either direction. So there are a bunch of solution providers have done that in a centralized way. The question is, can a blockchain do that more efficiently? There's another opportunity, which is uh, pre-invoice or pre-shipment, and that depends upon reducing the, uh, the risk for the lender. And blockchain offers, so we, we already see some, again, uh, there's fewer, very fewer networks that do this, but they try to provide a history of visibility of performance for a particular supplier, and also visibility into current, you know, exactly where they are in the process. They've built out this work in, in, pro, in well, you know, uh, work in progress, or they've shipped things. And by providing that more detailed history of actual performance that you can trust, then the lender uh, can lend at a low, lower rate. So it also uh, provides the opportunity of providing, again, this visibility into uh, how much, is this a trustworthy supplier that's gonna deliver, therefore I'm willing to lend them money even before they've gotten, uh, they've, they've delivered it at a lower rate. Supply chain insurance is another, another uh, option that people are talking about right now, new insurance products that could be built upon this sort of, you know, richer information. Dan, you wanna add something? Or you? Just uh, some intersections, I think, um I, th I think for the, for the fintech sector, it, that requires more regulation. You know, the SEC, Reg D, and all this exists for a reason, you know, so your grandmother doesn't get, like, ripped off and stuff. I mean, I think uh, it just happened you know, yesterday in China. You know, they, they shut it down. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's lots of innovation in fintech, but I, I, I don't think that's going to move the needle on the GDP. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I think by carving the waste out of the supply chain, that'll drive more margin back to people who invent stuff and things, you know, and these are things that people buy. Uh, that's sort of a belief I have, it's sort of like a philosophical thing that drives like why we even do this, yeah. you know. I wanna just riff <laughs> a little bit on what he's saying. So if we go back to, let's say the mid 1800s, right? I'm a farmer, I'm out plowing in my fields, I hit a rock, the tooth of my plow breaks. I go to my general store and I say, hey Jack, I'm gonna give you a bag of grain as soon as I finish the harvest, I'm just gonna take this today. Jack says, fine, I mean, I've known him my whole life, et cetera. I go back, finish plowing, I deliver the grain. He's happy because he really likes making bread because I make great grain. Fast forward to now, I'm a consultant. I'm working on a pitch, I drop my Mac, it's broken. I go into the Apple store and I say, hey Jack, I'm working on this pitch, as soon as I deliver it, I'll come back and you know, give you a bag of grain for this computer that I'm gonna to take today. Hmm. That does not happen. Mm -hmm. And so we've taken what was in fact a fairly easy to use system where you know, we got what we both needed, Jack and I, which is I needed the plow and he needed the grain. And we said, you know what, it's not always easy to match needs. And so we're gonna invent this thing called money and we're going to create credit cards so that it's easy to carry them around and we're gonna and validate that you have enough money and that it's you know, the right kind of money. And if we think about blockchain as a way to facilitate those transactions, do we actually need money, right? Well, right? Yeah. All we need is that trusted interaction of, I've delivered the value to you and I know that you will deliver that value back to me. Now, on the permission permissionless, if it's permissionless, the de value transaction has to happen at one time. If it's permissioned, you could actually have it delay over time. And you could sort of literally go into the Apple store and be like, yeah, I'll pay you with a, grain of, uh, a bag of grain when I'm done with it. But we need to think, I mean, what I think is interesting about this is exactly what Dan said, is we're not focusing then on how do we change the current processes in financial services. We're focusing on how do people get what they need? And what's the most efficient way to do that? And how does blockchain make that possible by creating trust and creating relationships? Yeah. I mean, finance has been with us for hundreds of years and we've just assumed that it is a natural state. But in fact, it's just a solution to a problem, right? And, and 
if there's another solution. Now, I don't, I don't think we are going to a moneyless world uh, tomorrow, but, <laughs> um, but it, is, it is important to put all the cards on the table, which include, you know, really, finance or just at least the way it is currently designed, it may, it may be quite different. You know? I, I think finance is to blockchain as, the porn, as porn was to the internet. <laughs> I mean, it's the low-hanging fruit that yeah. those who want to make the fast buck go there, you yeah. know? And uh, I mean, this sort of, you know, this comes into sort of like the rubric for why we think about I'm, I'm wondering how, because I think finance is going to be disrupted. I don't know, like the alternative, the alternative to porn, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> VR. <laughs> it's come. Anyway, um, maybe there's some questions. Uh, we do have a, a mic that I can hand around. There's one up there. I'll do the, the Donahue thing. Yeah. All right. Yes. You are. I like this. Walking up the steps. There we go. Thank you. Can you give us your name? I just, Travis is my name. Um, I just wanted to ask what the top risks are associated with using and implementing blockchain. Is there a consensus top three risks? I mean, Bridget and Sam, you both touched on it, but you know, is there a consensus top three? I mean, I don't think there's any kind of consensus on this at this point. I, I, I mean, and I think the risks are going to be two things, right? One is the underlying blockchain technology, can it do everything that we want it to do? And the second is the solutions that we build on top of it, are they, for me the biggest risk there is, are they going to be designed in a way with governance that actually fulfills the promise of what they're supposed to do and delivers on the, the sort of contract that they make with their clients in saying this is how we're going to create trust and this is why the value is there. So those would be the two I would see. Is that the watching the watcher question? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> yeah, it's actually, is it security, is it protocol, is it uh, decentralization? Is it something you say is one of the helpful parts of blockchain, but it can also be a security issue, right? So all these things seem to present risk that blockchain brings in with all these wonderful things that we think it'll fix. Uh, well, uh, one thing that occurs to me is I think uh, there's a architecture risk, and what I mean by that is blockchain, I hear so many different opinions about how blockchain should be used, what its role is, uh, and, and I, so I think everyone is still figuring that out, and so at this early stage, uh, it's really important to get someone who's got a pretty good perspective on that. But um, you could build a solution and find out, hey, this is really, we're trying to do the wrong things. We're using it in the wrong way for the wrong things. And so I think that's, that's, that's one risk at this stage. I think two or three or five years from now, we'll have a lot more of that sorted out. Uh, hello. Uh, so my name is Tufik. I'm a master's engineering in supply chain uh, at MIT. Uh, so my question is to, uh, is for uh, Bridget. You mentioned that uh, the financial gains are the base uh, to be able to scale this technology and apply it in other, uh, in all the industries. Uh, were you able, was IBM able to quantify the gains out of uh, your project with uh, Walmart? Do you have any tangible results? Or are we still in the pilot uh, uh, phase? And if there, if there is any uh, financial gains, uh, why isn't everyone doing blockchain? I mean, blockchain is sexy because no one understands it and because there is a lot of doubt about its uh, potential, right? So, so I mean, using the, uh, the pilot in food safety that we did with Walmart as a starting place, we, um, we announced in June that what had taken Walmart about a week, six days, 18 hours, and 26 minutes, which was to do traceability on a pack of processed mangoes that we were able to do in a couple of seconds. And we've done work, which we haven't sort of externally quantified, on what kinds of savings that then mean, that kind of improvement means for a 
company like Walmart or one of their, the suppliers or anyone else in the ecosystem. And we believe and we've demonstrated to folks who have gotten engaged with us that there is significant financial opportunity and cost savings. I would say the reason that more folks than have joined with us in the collaboration haven't joined is because we're trying to build this as fast as we can and it's actually hard and we are building it and we've got an amazing team working on it, um, but we wanna build it right and so we wanna make sure that we're inviting folks in as we can sort of accommodate and so it really is how quickly can you build the system, you know, build the jet while it's flying? And that's, that's what we're doing right now with blockchain. I think at IBM and I think in a lot of other places. And so I do think you will see scale, but keep in mind, last year, we were still trying to build the Hyperledger fabric and the underlying technology. Now we're building the fabric on top of that. So absolutely 100%. You have to have a business case. People have to believe that this is worth investing in from a technology and from a solution perspective. But on top of that, we all have to be working fast, but also have a little bit of patience for the realities that, you know, the developers I know are friggin' amazing, but they're not magic. They can't code entire systems overnight, even though I try to get them to do that sometimes. Hi, thank you for the um, awesome panel and discussion so far. I have two questions. One is actually for the audience. How many people here are building applications or technology using blockchain? Okay, fairly good show of hands. For the panelists, can you talk about your decision to select a blockchain platform, what it offered you, what you chose, if you support multiple blockchain platforms, why you chose to do that, um, to help those who are interested in building to make their selection and help us understand where the best choice is? Thank you. Uh, I'll take... I'll take a shot at that. Um, we, we initially built on Ethereum, um, not because uh, we felt Ethereum was far superior to maybe Hyperledger. Um, we really see, and, and we talked about the need for standards and we talked about the need for interconnectivity. It's gonna be a multi-chain world out there and you know, our view is, is that you have to be chain agnostic. And so as we have architected our solutions in particular, we've, been, we've tried to abstract a way to where we can be chain agnostic. It's not easy in all cases. And in the early days, I mean, when we started building our first proof of concept, I mean, we had to go in and actually modify some of the, the open source code in order to get it to do what we wanted to do. A lot of those problems are being solved and we haven't had to do that recently. Um, but, it's, it, but it is a trade-off and I think that um, especially as it relates to supply chain, it's going to be a, um, it's going to, be, everyone has pre-existing infrastructure that you're going to have to work with. And those infrastructure providers also have pre-existing preferences towards different uh, technology stacks. And the chain is going to be part of the technology stack and, um, and we think that you, you need to be agnostic there. But to get a, a, a proof of, con if, you, if you keep that in mind in the design phase of your, your, your application development, then you can potentially uh, migrate from one platform to multiple chain platforms in the future. I just add uh, one thing to that. It, it, looking at uh, the approach that IBM and, and Microsoft are taking, and you can correct me if you've got a different perception on this. So Microsoft, you know, they're uh, like an OS and tool provider, and they're really taking um, that approach to, you know, provide blockchain as a service and really address the developer uh, market, whereas IBM uh, has more uh, bench strength in consulting and really will step in and help you kind of build these whole uh, app applications. So part of it depends on where you're at as an organization, whether you've got, you want to build it all yourself or whether you want to get help from uh, your, your, your provider um, in when you choo choose the, the solution. And, and I, I will just sort of take, 
That's not a, um, so we just announced the IBM blockchain platform in August. And what that is is a tool for developers to build, develop governance for, and operate and run a blockchain network. So yes, we have a phenomenal consulting services organization that can help people who don't want to do it. But one of the things that we actually saw a gap in the market was how do you get from I want to do something with blockchain, but I don't have a lot of experience building it, and I want to make sure I can run it in a way that's secure and scalable and FIPS level four compliant or you know whatever it is that you need. And we didn't see that in the market, and so we built the blockchain platform to help people do that. Hi, uh, I'm Steve Stepman with Radio Robots. So, you know, is it a supply chain or which with linearity, good comment, or is it an ecosystem? And it seems to me that there's a complementarity because I'm not going to get a Cat D7 to go knock down some jungle uh, in the middle of nowhere with an ecosystem, okay? Because it has to be built. It weighs, don't quote me, 60 tons, and it has to be delivered, and it needs fuel. So on the one hand, moving data is very good. Sam's going to ensure that I don't get poisoned by the pills I take. That's great. On the other hand, it, it strikes me that there's a lot of, I think there needs to be a little more thinking about what makes this thing have value if it goes beyond data. So here are the roses to Rotterdam, right? Now what gives those roses value is that they get sold on the street on Queen's Day, okay? And if they just sit outside the port at Rotterdam, which as you know often happens, they're not worth much. So it strikes me that, again, one has to think of this kind of dynamic tension where the, the, the supply chain uh, will feed the ecosystem or the ecosystem will feed the, the supply chain. And I'm not trying to cop out, it's just a very long discussion. But I think that that really needs to be looked at because otherwise it's just moving more data. And, and, and that strikes me is not useful if you're making things. Anyone care to comment? I mean, I, I would just totally agree with you. It, and so uh, perhaps um, maybe in my excitement, I, I frame some of our stuff. But the, the way that I think about it is building out this business ecosystem and so that you can almost create the supply chain that's right for you at any given point in time. You don't have to be held hostage to a supply chain you've, already, you've always used before because you can dynamically decide at that point who is the right vendor to use because you have information, you have clarity, right? Like as a, as a golden end state, that's where I see it happening. And so, so from my perspective, the idea of focusing on the ecosystem is, is to focus on creating the environment that allow you to optimize the supply chain that's right for you because to your point, if you don't have a supply chain, you don't have something delivered from point A to point B. Hi, um, my name is Kim Silva. I want to go back to um, fighting corruption and trade-based money laundering. So with corruption, it goes back to the original transaction and that goes back to the due diligence that allows somebody to get into that supply chain. So. Um, and trade-based money laundering with those transactions. That requires somebody to be looking at those transactions. Now you're making them more transparent, but does that necessarily mean that someone's gonna be looking at them more? Because they could be doing that now. So um, I'm wondering how the blockchain technology is going to aid that. And then the other part of my question is, as this is being built out, is there any discussion of that information regarding corruption and money laundering that's going to bring that up to the regulators and you know the Department of Justice and the people that are fighting the financial crime. Because right now, like what we have in the banks, it's a pretty inefficient system, right? Someone files a suspicious activity report, it goes up, so you've got this bank over here and this bank over here, and it's not connecting the pieces that gives them the information. This might be a great tool to kind of consolidate that information um, and better inform um, that that part of it. So, yeah, I have a, I, an observation on that, um, but it's it's a concept that can also be applied in fintech. So, as an example, uh, one of the things we did in North Dakota is we 
we have this deep data set of about 9 million acres of land with 15,000 wells. Everything that's happened in those wells with every operator since 2003 is in the data set, and it's in, you know, basically an encrypted data set with blockchain. So I, I'm a deep believer in, in analytics, and people talk a lot about predictive analytics, but I think you can't predict anything until you can fully describe it. So I, I, what we can do is we can literally predict where spills will happen in North Dakota now on, on a given uh, landowner's property, uh, from a given operator, et cetera. I think the same thing exists in, in the financial sector. Um, because it, I, I think a key, a, a key takeaway here is there should be no centralized system. It's a massively federated system. And the query into that federated system gives the descriptive data that allows us to do analytics. And then you can literally predict where evil, you know, the bad actors are going to be. So it's once again, it's not just the blockchain, it's the the integration of that with some other technology that I think it helps target where that is. Now, it's a regulatory thing. I think this is one of the reasons like our company stays away from all things coin, because I think there's a regulatory barrier and hurdle to actually scaling, you know? Um, that's, that's my input. Well, so what I would add to, to what Dan said is, we estimate that 80% of the world's data is sitting in silos in databases around the world. You can't do big data on silos, right? You need to look at a picture of it as big data. And the bigger, the better. I mean, big data works best with huge data sources because then you can figure out what's real and what's not and what's garbage and what's not. And so if we go from, hey, we have the data, but you have to look at it in each little slice, which doesn't give you any insight as to what, into what's going on, to I have a single federated data set that everybody can, or, or that whoever's permissioned, whatever, however you, you govern it, can look at. But somebody can look at the whole thing and find those trends that are so hard to find until you look at the whole picture. That's what the difference is. And, and that's why figuring out what the problem that you're solving is and what the data sets are that you need and who you need to engage and how you need to engage them is so important is because you have to make sure that you're getting the right data sets. You're getting the broadest possible picture so that you can stop using blockchain and start using big data to figure out what those answers are. I will say on your regulatory comment, you know, I've been working in new technologies for a long time. Regulators are kind of the people who say, why don't you go figure out what you're going to do and then come back to us when it works, when you can demonstrate it, and we'll evaluate it. IBM had two press releases in the last six months where regulators were quoted talking positively about blockchain pilots. And the reason is because regulators, this is my, my explanation, that regulators see this as the way to get the auditability, the immutability, the visibility that they've been looking for. And, you know, they've got shrinking budgets, expanding responsibilities, and they are thrilled with the idea that there is a technology that is actually well aligned with their goals in trying to make the world a safer, better place for people. So, exactly. I wouldn't call it a central repository, though, because it's not. It's, it's a massively federated repository that requires really great search to, to discover it and then maybe aggregate analytics about it. But it's radically, it's radically decentralized. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Central, central is a, a dangerous word in this regard. So um, let's, let's wrap it up. This is pretty much where we've come to the end here, but I, I think maybe just as a very, very quick statement from each of you, what I like to think of is maybe if you can give us a call to arms, what is it that you would want the people in this room to take off with them? Because this is, this is an enterprise. We talked about it being a social technology. It involves people who are engaged to walk off with it and build stuff with it and change the future. What would you, what do you want these people to walk away with at this point, Dan, and head down the line? Put me on the spot. For Put you on the spot, happened. man, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, my call to action is always the same thing. Just do it, you know? Like, if there are people here doing companies. Just freaking get out there and do it. Um, you don't need to look for standards. I, I, I believe that the standards always follow markets. Innovation happens first. Standards follow. 
Anyone who goes and seeks permission from a standard will have a losing company. So like my take is get after it, you know? Like there's, the, one of the reasons to be here is there are only, I think, two places in the United States, really, this might alienate some people. If you want to be in software, I think it's right here, and I think in Palo Alto. So uh, you're, in, you're in the hotbed of, of innovation here, and the Media Lab, CSAIL, everything else. So this is the place, I mean, these kind of meetups are super cool. This reminds me of the Homebrew Club, you know, like, you know, 40 years ago. That's what this is, and that, that, that's my... Yeah, I, I would I would echo that. I, I I mean I think you know this is a nascent technology and it's it's a wide open world. Um, you know, really the opportunities are limitless in terms of your imagination of how you can apply the technology. And um, you know, it's don't get hung up on you know technical stacks or product stacks or any of that stuff. I had a, a very smart person once. I was struggling over trying to figure out what what open source tools to use and what languages. And he, and he was a, a very senior Silicon Valley computer scientist. And he said, what are you talking about? It doesn't matter. Just go build it. And if you build the right thing, it won't matter what the underlying infrastructure is. So, so that, that would be my advice is, is, you know, play with the technology, go out there and innovate. And, and, and think outside the box and just, just make things happen and don't worry about uh, sort of trying to conform to any of the things that, uh, you, know, you know, don't really matter at this point in time. Sam? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd echo that as well. There, I can't count the number of times I've sat in a room of like cryptographers fighting over, um, you know, the most specific of details. So on that point, you know, think of the business case beyond what you're trying to do. If you don't see it in terms of a tech stack, create it, create a blockchain, I'd contribute to open source. Um, also kind of think of the, the implications behind what you're doing. So a lot of what, you know, my personal thinking over the past year or two have been focused in kind of sustainability um, and, and ethical applications of blockchain for supply chain and, and additional applications, so I mean, how do you, you do good? Uh, so those are kind of my, my points. I think those are all great points. I, I think the one thing I, I would add is think about what the problem is that you wanna solve. I mean, there are real business and social problems that blockchain can solve, and it's not about how do I transform a process. It's about how do I solve the problem because blockchain is transformative and it's gonna allow you to think differently and do things differently. And so it's not an incremental change. It could be a real step function change. And so start with the right problem. And that means people who know the space and it also means people who are able to think innovatively and creatively about the space. Kind of following on many of the themes, education, partnership, and experimentation are things I think of, because it's very early days, so you're gonna hear lots of different opinions on what's the right path and, and how to do this stuff, so you need to be as informed as you can, but you also need to partner, because you can't learn everything, right? So find some partner that's, that's uh, partners that are, that are smart and trusting that help you get there. And then the experimentation, because uh, it's gonna take time to figure this out, and so, you know, start trying things and take some baby steps, and, and um, I, I think you can find some really interesting things that work. There you have it, folks. Off you go. Change the world. A round of applause for the panel, please.